So just that you know, I will tell you in the chat when when you go live. I will type there. You're live now, okay? Yeah, cool. Monique? Yes. Over to you, we're live. So should I go ahead, uh, Brendan, or? Yes, yes, go you ahead. You prefer to introduce me. Okay. So welcome everyone to the session that we have today as part of the Big Data Value Forum, which is going to explore edge computing, the convergence, uh, the convergence point in the human Human Cloud Continuum Framework. We're delighted to open with uh, our colleague Monique, who's going to, who's coordinator of the EUIoT CSA, is going to provide a bit of context before we hand over to our panel discussion, before later exploring some of the opportunities to join in with the NGIT initiative with the projects Assist IoT and IoT Engine. Over to you, Monique. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, now I should be able to share my screen. Coming in a second. So here we go. I hope you're all doing fine, despite the situation is becoming crazy once again for all of us. Um, so we would very much prefer to be uh, all together in the same place, but we are virtually here uh, to share a few thoughts uh, about edge computing and the convergence uh, point in the human cloud continuum framework. I hope you can see my slide in the right modality, meaning in the presenters. Okay, great. Thank you, Federico. And um, so I'm the coordinator of the uh, European project EU IoT that is at work to build a strong European IoT and edge ecosystem. Uh, there are uh, five partners uh, running these projects, Fortis, Blue Specs, Martel Innovate, Intrasoft International, and Aarhus University. Um, the uh, challenge and, and the approach somehow is to uh, ensure that we create a strong ecosystem that is linking all the major stakeholders, communities and initiatives in the area of Internet of Things in Europe. And uh, the idea is very much uh, to make sure that all the various place, the players in the value chain uh, uh, creation um, for uh, Internet of Things and their application in a variety of sectors um, allows to engage all the players. In fact, one of the key aspects is that IoT and Edge see really much the convergence of different technologies. And this is why there are several players and communities that are traditionally separated. So uh, we try to avoid segmentation. We try to link them together, but we also try to close the gap between the demand and the supply, matching uh, uh, market uh, pull factors with the technology push uh, aspects. And also one of the main priorities is to ensure that also the smaller players, especially those uh, that uh, create uh, the tissue of the European eco economy, that is the vast majority, vast majority is, is SMEs, um, can engage into uh, this ecosystem and benefit of uh, the various resources that are available. Now, um, there are some key aspects that are of high relevance for um, all the European players in the IoT edge space, and they are becoming even more important in forward-looking perspective, looking also at how Horizon Europe is uh, pushing for um, the situation to evolve. First of all, uh, openness. Openness is one of the core um, value, but also one of the um, characteristic traits of um, the European efforts uh, that are pushing for open source, open data, open standards, and open hardware. Um, this is very much a field that is allowing uh, innovation to be nurtured and to grow uh, beyond individual projects uh, boundaries. 
um, we uh, also um, try to work and harmonize across efforts that are not necessarily um, IoT centric. There are a lot of uh, efforts that come from uh, the cloud computing community, but also uh, from the AI, from the 5G and beyond 5G. So the key idea is really to uh, connect all of them. And uh, another uh, key aspect is that uh, it's essential also uh, to reconsider how um, we need uh, not only an intelligence, but also a resilient infrastructure. The COVID situation has shown how much we depend on digital means for accessing also very essential services. And this is why there is a convergence of aspects that do not only relate uh, to technology, but they relate to business, they relate to education, they relate to societal inclusion. Now, um, this is the, you know, the desirat. How do we get there? How do we get to a connected uh, ecosystem um, that, that overcomes complexity? Well, we need to, first of all, take into account that there is a, quite of a number of complexity factors. Um, and they are um, dictated by some emergency situation that, that we are all uh, living now. Um, but it's also related to some uh, key aspect that is, uh, first of all, the transition from the, the Horizon 2020 framework program to a new program, the Horizon Europe, that started uh, beginning uh, of this year, but of course that has incurred several delays due to the pandemic. Um, there are also a number of um, projects in the uh, community uh, which have uh, pushing priorities in possibly several directions. And there are communities, uh, initiatives, not only at the research level, but also at the industrial innovation level, uh, like AIOTI, Artemisia, uh, BDBA, uh, ADRA, um, and you name it. Um, but also an increasing um, prominence of efforts in uh, standardization and open source uh, communities like uh, Eclipse, Etsy, Fire, and so on and so forth that are working um, across uh, this community. Now, to bring them all, all together, I tell you, it's not an easy task and it's not necessarily what we want, but we need to link them. We need to listen to all the various aspects in order to really create a roadmap for European efforts to become relevant and impactful. So um, what we are doing in the EU IoT project, and today we are, are gonna talk about a number of those aspects together with our um, invited experts, is um, to try to connect the dots and uh, um, create uh, the, the foundation of this uh, uh, strong, vibrant EU IoT ecosystem, in which um, there are several different um, spaces we are um, investigating from a technical point of view in the transition that goes from the human to the, um, let's say, uh, core of the, of the network, the cloud services. So there are uh, human interfaces, there are devices involved, there are gateways, access networks, there are uh, the big um, cloud uh, computing infrastructures. Um, and uh, there is, uh, last but not least, uh, the necessity to serve these data spaces that are becoming so much of, of a central um, aspect in our uh, digital transformation. Because in fact, all of this infrastructure uh, from the human to the cloud allows to exchange data and allows to elaborate data that provides value and services uh, to the user. And with the edge, of course, this, this transition is pushing for data uh, value creation more towards where the data is created, more towards uh, where the users and the consumers are. We have produced a um, um, couple of white papers, uh, deliverables within our project, and late in the last few days, on the 29th of October, we published a new version of this uh, deliverable. Uh, you can find it there, and you can also uh, provide comments. I put here the URL uh, for the um, page where you can find it. Just go to the ngiot.eu uh, uh, website, and in the news, you will find it as the first news. Now, today uh, we're gonna try to explore a few aspects that together with the EU IoT uh, project, we tried to capture. 
So, as I mentioned before, uh, we see this uh, transition from, you know, human cloud continuum going through um, several, uh, uh, let's say, research and innovation areas. One concerns human and IoT interfaces, one con con uh, concerns the far edge, then we have the near edge that is closer to the infrastructure, then we have the, the let's say, networking data uh, infrastructure, and finally we have the data spaces. Um, we have identified together with experts and uh, various um, consulted advisors um, what are the main priorities, what are the main key aspects that need further investigation. And today we will discuss some of them with our uh, invited speakers. Uh, what is clear is that there is um, an increasing push for intelligence uh, at the edge. There is an increasing push for decentralization um, because architectures need to be uh, multi-access and, and more flexible to different use cases, different needs, but also different uh, devices and, and, uh, and network um, interfaces. And also there is more and more the necessity to create context dependent IoT edge platforms, because of course, not only in the, in the use um, cases, there is diversity, but there is diversity also on the boundary conditions at policy regulation legal level, depending on the various also vertical market segments where these technologies are deployed. Um, clearly, there are some important aspects uh, that uh, that you can see here, some pull factors that are uh, of high relevance. First of all, uh, we need low power and reduced traffic. We need reduced lat lat latency for real-time decisions. Uh, we need to ensure privacy and security, especially if you think that, you know, a lot of these use cases concern really access to healthcare services, and, and education, so really essential uh, aspects of our everyday life. And then we need, of course, efficiency in terms of costs and sustainability. We need these devices to be green and to help us greening the environment. Now, uh, this is challenging. Uh, this is where, why we're working together with uh, other players uh, for this next generation IoT uh, initiative and context uh, to grow. Uh, we need collaboration, we need to unify uh, ecosystems and networks to deliver volume. Uh, we need intelligence across the board from tiny machine learnings to high performance computing. Uh, so intelligence is everywhere, must be everywhere. We need to support open source and open standards, defining what are the major mechanisms to allow interoperability of different devices and different technologies. But we also need to foster new skills um, and new, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, specialists to be able to uh, bring everyone on board. Uh, nobody should be left behind. And uh, most, um, and last but not least, we need to make sure that this transition, this digital transition is green uh, by design. Not easy, we're at work on this. And today uh, in the next session, which will be uh, moderated by Tania Suarez from Blue Specs, we will hear in more details what the community is doing from different perspectives. So I pass now the floor to Tania uh, for follow-up discussions. Thank you very, Monique. Um, that was uh, incredible scene setting for our conversation um, now. Maybe just a couple of things before I introduce my, my colleagues on the panel. Um, I think that first of all, uh, please don't anyone be put off by the word deliverable. This is Eurospeak, but in the reports that Monique referred to, there's an incredible wealth of information. So I really do um, suggest that you look at those and please do get back to us with any comments that uh, you know can push thinking uh, to the next stage and can really help us get this um, to uh, a stage of deployment and awareness and, and of use that is valuable, not just the business, but, but the society. Um, so, uh, and possibly just another point there actually, the, the Data Act, and I think this is something that I'd like to ask also the panelists about, that's going to 
be a really interesting backdrop for many of the things that we're going to be discussing and exploring in the next panel. So um, this next panel is called Dancing on the Edge, Accessing New Value from Data on the Edge. And with me, I'm very happy to welcome Christian Winkler from Siemens, Federica Facker from HCloud, and Mirko Pressa from Aarhus University. They're all colleagues of ours. We are all part of the same ecosystem, and we are really uh, happy to be able to, to be together once again and to explore some of the, the cutting edge issues around uh, edge computing and um, data use and where it's going to be adding more value. Before we ask uh, the, the, the questions that uh, are going to help us explore these issues in, in greater detail, I would like to invite each of my colleagues to just give a very brief presentation on who they are, what their role is, and what they could feel they can contribute to the panel. So Christian, if I could perhaps start with you, please. Okay, so thank you very much for the intro. Uh, my name is Chris Winkler. I'm uh, with Siemens Corporate Technology, which is so to say the central R&D uh, department of Siemens. And there I have the position of a senior principal expert in IoT. My background actually is electrical engineering. I hold a PhD in communication technology. And before I joined corporate technology, I had various positions in Siemens business units. Um, mainly in the area of communication technology. As you may remember, Siemens was active in this game quite some years ago. Uh, currently, I'm also active, uh, besides being in the expert group of this endeavor here, uh, in the uh, um, IPSI SIS, so the, uh, this uh, economic subsidy program uh, on the Cloud Edge continuum. And this, uh, what I see there is certainly also impacting the way I'm looking into the uh, edge discussion uh, that we have today. So a little bit on maybe background on what I think about edge, uh, if this is now the appropriate time. Uh, to to elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, Siemens, as you know, or is this not the right time? Natalia? No, 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 please do go ahead and then we'll pass on to Federico. So please do. Okay, okay. So uh, Siemens is, as you know, an OT player. So we are active in various domains like discrete manufacturing, process industries, smart buildings, smart grid, mobility, rolling stock. So more or less everything uh, that you uh, that you would see as uh, as the basis infrastructure for many businesses. Um, and in all of our domains, the digital enablement is, so to say, the very key topic for new business models, optimized processes, and also environment protection uh, tasks. And the interesting thing is that in all of our domains, we now see edge computing as a very central element of the game. But, and that's where it becomes complex, the architectures, the underlying architectures are quite different. So some are more cloud centric, some with a strong on-premise focus, some are highly distributed like smart grid or the rail uh, examples. Some have reliable connectivity to run uh, the edge uh, uh, connectivity to, uh, uh, to the cloud, for example, some only intermittent like on rolling stock uh, where you only from time to time have connectivity. Some are cost, cost sensitive and that's why uh, probably the uh, it's there's no one size fits all um, uh, edge stack or edge architecture from uh, the device edge to the cloud edge that really covers all the use cases in, in, in the same way. Um, or let's put it in the other, uh, in other words, the usefulness and potential applications of near edge and far edge uh, varies a lot depending on the specific use cases and domains. By the way, we uh, also have a little bit a different definition on far edge, but I think we're gonna touch that later uh, will, compared Chris. to the picture yeah. that we saw in the intro. Thank what we at least see as a common denominator for all is that all make use of on-premise on edges. Uh, so the on-prem I think we just lost uh, Chris. Yeah, I was just wondering whether it was me. Um, perhaps if we take this this opportunity um, Chris for, is, back. is he? Chris? Okay, no. Hi, Chris. I think you wanted to hand over, right? 
Yes, exactly. And I think that you just dropped off this, but we can we can pick up on some of the things perhaps mm-hmm. that you were just uh, yeah, discussing there in just a second. So, um, yeah, just to introduce perhaps some of the other panellists before delving deeper into some of the issues that you very nicely framed there in your introduction. Federico, would you like to introduce yourself and very briefly tell us yeah, sure. what your experience <laughs> is and what you thank you? Uh, so uh, my name is Federico and uh, I'm uh, working as CTO at Martel Innovate and uh, at the time being I'm uh, also coordinating uh, HCloud, as you say, in the field of cloud computing and uh, of course there uh, we are looking uh, at the same topics as UIoT but from the perspective uh, of the cloud uh, uh, computing projects and uh, a research agenda. And of course, uh, uh, it's interesting to see how this is converging somehow on different aspects from the point of view, especially of the application domains. And uh, I leave to Mirko. Yes, Mirko. May I ask you to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, uh, thank you, Tanya, and uh, thank you, Chris and Federico, as well as Monique for you know setting the scene already. So I'm um, an associate professor at Aarhus University at the Faculty of Business and Social Sciences, and I work in a specific department that overlaps engineering and business, actually. We, we are called um, Business Development and Technology. We work a lot with uh, Siemens Gamesan, for instance. We have uh, a big factory out there, as well as um, Vestas is uh, around the corner as well, of course. So we work a lot with manufacturing companies. And my specific interest in the area is actually to combine you know, various uh, digital technologies with manufacturing. So we work on blockchain, IoT, um, on distributed architectures, for instance, uh, towards compliance-based uh, uh, systems and so on. So I have a particular interest myself in working on these topics from an application perspective, but my main focus at the department is actually working with uh, digitalization and business models. And in particular, we're looking at IoT and business models there. And this is also the relationship that I have into this context, which is I'm also a member of the team of the EUIT or NGIOT um, context uh, where Monique is coordinating and I'm together with Tanya and Brandon and Federico and so on, working on uh, the various uh, deliverables that you mentioned, Tanya. So, <laughs> and I'm looking forward to talking a bit further. I think, Chris, you've mentioned a lot of really interesting stuff that I want to pick up on. Um, yeah, so I'm Let, let's, to yeah, let, let's kick off the conversation because I think Chris was um, one of the things, and I think it was just before he dropped off, um, said that actually there's no one size fits all and the usefulness of um, computing really varies greatly across the far and near edge. So perhaps for the uninitiated, could we start with how you see or where you see um, the far edge and the near edge and where those boundaries actually are? Um, we, we've heard also the concept of uh, the fuzzy edge. Is it a thing or is it just something that appears on somebody's blog and then somebody kind of, it just gets repeated? Um, maybe, uh, Chris, if we can come back to you and, and you can start with your views on that, please. It's maybe Chris has dropped off. Um, Mirko, perhaps yeah. if you can, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Chris, you're there. Okay. My- I think the web client sometimes does a few uh, naughty things. Uh, can... uh, very badly, Chris. Yeah. It, it could also be the reason that uh, Germany is now all working from home again. Uh, oh. It's a bandwidth issue. With, uh... Okay. Chris, we'll try one more time. And if not, we can ask maybe um, we've got to... There we go. Chris has, has muted himself. We've got perhaps if you can answer that question and we'll come back to Chris when he has better connectivity. So, I mean, about the definition, I mean, um, definitions along the line of uh, now where we are in the uh, edge cloud continuum and uh, what that specific is, I think makes sense in contexts like uh, standardization more than, let's say, for people that are now developing applications. I think eventually we will crystallize um, the definitions out more and more as, you know, industry is picking up the technology more and more and we can see uh, solutions emerging. So I think 
one of the issues that we'll probably talk about later on as well now is that, you know, IoT is complex, but we kind of solve the cloud-centric way of making IoT applications work. So this is something that Edge is uh, edging against or moving against somehow, trying to challenge. Uh, but I don't think we, we need to argue about definitions per se. Um, uh, but I would still like to hear Chris's version of uh, his far edge definition, of course, to see if we're missing some sort of set of requirements that be uh, some nuances that we see in, in the requirements or the uses of edge. Um, because um, if we don't have it, as a solution, we, we have it as a concept. We need to use language to elaborate on it. Absolutely. Um, Chris, I'll just ask you to unmute when you are when you feel that you can um, connect more or less stably. Um, in the interim, Federica, would you like to um, jump in on the question? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, of course, uh, 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 I agree with Mirko. I mean, um, Spending time on saying uh, what is uh, far edge or near edge, uh, it's probably <laughs> not a good uh, uh, way of uh, using our time because the truth is that there is no agreement at the moment. There is not going to be us, the one who bring up the agreement, but it's more likely that uh, uh, in-stone definition will come from standardization bodies, as Mirko said. Of course, uh, uh, it is very true that uh, uh, you have uh, a different perspective from the in different industrial actors. Clearly, the telco thinks uh, uh, edge in some terms. Uh, in, in the industrial IoT, the edge is seen in another term. And this also means what, what does it mean to be far edge or, or near edge? Uh, in my uh, personal uh, view, uh, yeah, yeah. Federico, I'm just, I just want to be really opportunistic and I can yeah. actually see Chris now. Yeah, yeah, please. So I'm going to ask yeah. him to, to come in. So Chris, we were talking about, you know, you, you mentioned um, that the usefulness varies across the far and near edge. Um, and we'd like you to, to, to maybe um, expand a little bit on that. Um, Mirko was saying, uh, and Federico was agreeing that actually, technical definitions between what sits where and perhaps not so necessary other than for standard standardization um, initiatives but um, for practitioners really there's there's no um, there's no need to define where the far edge or the near edge start and end but from a practitioner perspective and somebody who's absolutely working in this in the cold face what have you seen is this a relevant distinction because you've already said that the usefulness can vary yeah uh, so what is clear, at least from our perspective, is that one demarcation line is certainly the, the question on-premise, off-premise. And from our point of view, it is uh, now not so important, uh, while well, taking aside some uh, technical aspects, which I can uh, come back to in a minute, uh, whether this is now a near edge uh, that we are talking to outside the premise, a far edge, uh, a regional edge, or a cloud. But of course, the closer the edge compute capability is to the premise, the more likely it is that you find stable connectivity and you are able to provide some real-time capability. And uh, so this is for us more the difference, whether you can really cover industrial grade quality um, with your edge compute capability it's uh, this is the more important question compared to whether it's a regional a far or whatsoever edge um, so um, we for, for the ease of our discussion we uh, tend to stick to the definition that we also use in the ipsi uh, which is a five level um, the specification starting with a device as an edge capability, an on-prem edge, and then the demarcation line to the public uh, sector comes, the far edge, the near edge, the regional edge, and the cloud. And to me personally, this, uh, this uh, five, level, five plus one level seems to be somehow reflecting the fact that we already heard we have many players in this cloud edge game who also all uh, have their sweet spot and want to establish interesting business cases. And I think the, 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 the summation of all those ideas is now this complex architecture. So I'm not really sure whether this is really backed completely by at least the industrial use cases. That oh, we thank see you. Today. That's, that's and, and I that's, think that's why I think. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. 
so so Mirko, I think that was QU because um, uh, Chris really referred there to the business case attached to you know the on-prem, off-prem, which have, is, is kind of like more of an IT old school distinction. But he actually related that to uh, the ability to have industrial grade connectivity and to be able to get that data to your mm. point of operations uh, when you actually need it. Um, so do you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I, I think um, there's a, sort of a clear case for moving processing towards the edge for actually two very conflicting reasons. One is, you know, Chris mentioned rolling stock, you know, you don't have connectivity all the time. So you actually have to have some intelligence on the systems to manage things uh, either autonomously or locally, at least for a period of time. Whereas uh, the other one is uh, the, the direct opposite. You have connectivity all the time because you're on premise, but you can't offload the processing to the cloud because that's just too far away physically. You know, speed of light is uh, you know limited. So you know, 300 kilometers if you want mil one millisecond uh, uh, delay in responses, uh, that's uh, the physical limit. So you know, they're they're two very different uh, arguments why you would want to do this but then when we get to the specific applications um, you know then those need to be very specific requirements to drive those and I think blanketing that for a specific sector or a specific purpose that's difficult and this is why you will have again like we had at the beginning of IoT this very complex mess of actors saying well far edge near edge no you can solve it with the cloud and there will be many business arguments for what you will choose in the end. Thank you, Federico. Uh, bringing in your experience, I think there with HCloud, how are you seeing that distinction and the, the relevance for different um, industrial sectors or even ecosystems? Because of course, it's not, it's not <clears throat> just about manufacturing, it's, it's about the supply chains as well. It's about you know, the ecosystems in which many businesses operate. Yeah. Uh, it's clear that, uh, as was already mentioned, uh, each actor in the ecosystem tried to position itself and uh, uh, to be sure that he has a central law role in this new uh, um, continuum uh, between the device up to the cloud. And, uh, uh, but I think that the, this is more the uh, view really of the, who is providing the technology. In the end, the central point of, uh, uh, of the understanding is who is using the technology and who, who are, what are the needs he has to realize uh, um, a, given, uh, a given solution. And uh, uh, my fear is that in this uh, sense, there is still uh, a lot of, to, be, to be done to really come up to meet this uh, requirement uh, and needs because uh, uh, in the end, what we are witnessing and uh, from different, let's say, direction from the network, from the IoT, from the cloud technology, we are, what we are seeing is different attempt to adapt and evolve technologies that are there to meet these new requirements. But of course, uh, uh, you know, it, it's like uh, when Ber uh, uh, Tim Berners-Lee was asked uh, if he would uh, design uh, the web the same way today as he designed uh, more than uh, 20 years ago. And the answer, of course, will be no. Yeah. So uh, if you need really to start today, probably thinking at this scenario, you will develop totally different technologies to be uh, uh, matching, appropriating this uh, application scenario. But the reality is that you have a number of technologies that are there and you need to interpret with and you need to integrate in the solution you are delivering. And this means that the only way to go for that is an evolutionary approach today. And uh, <clears throat> really, uh, the, the major one of the major challenges is, for example, I mean, we're talking about moving the processing uh, in, a, in a, a continuous way between the edge uh, and, the, and the cloud, but the truth is that the device you have in the cloud or in the edge are totally different. I mean, especially when you talk about IoT devices and clearly as of today, and maybe in the future it will be different. You don't have a, 
a, a, a piece of code that you move uh, from the cloud uh, to the edge and, and uh, works perfectly. Uh, the, 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 really, the hardware architecture are, are completely different. And, uh, and this is uh, uh, a big challenge if you want to move uh, the computation in the continuum in the seamless way. Uh, and, uh, and clearly, uh, then there are many other challenges as well. This is not the... Uh, the only one. I mean, we have problems with the uh, what is happening at the network level. Uh, we are now used to have a, a network as a sort of a, of commodity, but uh, in this new computing uh, uh, continuum scenario, I mean, you might want to have a, a commodity maybe with different uh, characteristics from the point of view of the network, which today you have totally not control over. Uh, in the in the continuum framework and the same things also for energy aspect and so on so clearly this is uh, i think there are a number of elements that will uh, uh, need still to be addressed uh, and uh, probably moving from uh, cloud native edge computing which is more or less the current uh, approach to defining what means to be edge native uh, in this uh, context. Thanks. Thanks, Federico. So I just want to uh, bring back Chris on, on the point, because you were saying that we're seeing different architectures, uh, you know, and, and we're seeing these again, um, you know, in the NGIOT um, program that, that we're running uh, with Medical. But Chris, you specifically mentioned that Federico saying that that's actually a problem um, for deploying and for really uh, scaling I suppose, uh, the adoption of the edge across industries. Is that also what you're seeing within Siemens and your clients? Yeah, actually, but I, I would shed maybe a little light on a completely different aspect of the adoption, which is not the, the question of which architecture I'm talking about. It's the fact that uh, it was mentioned before that the small medium enterprises are the, the very core of our economy. Uh, but at least in our experience, many of these small medium enterprises are not really the experts in IT. So uh, you cannot talk about complex architectures. We need to help them to get the first step into their digital uh, journey. And that means for me, all the discussion around edge and uh, edge cloud continuum and all that stuff always needs to uh, keep in mind who are we addressing. So it's in our case, it's OT folks. So we need to make sure that these solutions work plug and play, can be operated and installed by these kind of people and uh, um, uh, our experience is uh, at least for the SMEs the first thing to do is uh, provide them with some digital compute capabilities for example an on-premise edge or something uh, and start providing value and then you can start extending the architecture to something more complex where you talk about moving around workloads between different types of edges and all that stuff. So I think the solutions we come up with uh, also in the IoT domain may never keep uh, lose the view on the ease of use and uh, the, the way how to install it, to operate it, to automate all these processes and all that that stuff and i think for the application this is even more important compared to the question whether it's near or far or whatsoever edge yeah. no, no, and and just to to pick up on something you've said there and perhaps on the on the second part of the of the uh the, the name of the panel which is about accessing new value from data on the edge you've specifically referred to that as the driver for sme adoption they have to see the work where the value is um i just had some uh um, data come back from PitchBook and in the first uh, three quarters of, um, of, of this year, AI exits have topped $166 billion, which is more than three times the total of 2020. And many of the applications or main, many of the investments are in actually platforms that enable that very easy identification of data or integration of data and then the use of that data. Um, Mirko, maybe can I ask you um, about that in a little bit more detail? Why don't we have an advantage in this area? Because, you know, that you could say, oh, we, we have... We have a you know a great ecosystem. We have companies that are world leaders in industrial, many industrial spheres. But if you look at the AI exits, they are the biggest ones are in fact um, from from the US or even from China. 
what can we do to, to really make sure that we're at the, at, the, at the cutting edge of providing these very easy tools for, for SMEs, but also for large companies to use? No, I, I think, uh, I, I don't think we are, you know, if we measure, if we just take the measure and stick on the investments, you know, yes, clearly there is a, there is a problem. Um, you know, we, we don't, we're not competitive on that. Um, I think when we're looking at uh, the level of innovation, the, the topics that we're addressing and um, the smaller companies that are actually offering services in particular on data integration, I mean, I see it in Denmark uh, a lot that they're very interesting companies that are doing very interesting legacy-based work, but also um, I recently talked to a company that, uh, um, uh, well, I'm not... I'm not going to go into detail, but they do some um, uh, novel data integration across, you know, sectors that haven't been very digital, digitally focused. But they are very business oriented to make um, to not go for that large scale before they're actually making a business. They're making good businesses from the start. So I think there's an imbalance in how the how money is accessed or the ambition of the company at the app probably. But from a technological perspective, from an innovation perspective, um, I don't think that uh, we are outclassed or anything. I think it's maybe the ambition, uh, the way that you're trying to approach it, uh, that has a big, uh, big problem. What I'm immensely positive about, or you know, optimistic about, let's say, is that uh, with the current developments, I think. You know, companies like uh, Siemens now as an example, Chris being on the call, but, uh, you know, Bosch or Grundfos or some of the uh, um, companies that are providing infrastructure assets in particular, uh, they're, they're shifting towards the services. They're shifting towards integrating digital technologies and IT, including AI, into their products. Now, if they do this with partners or do that themselves, that is, you know, that depends on, on the organization and the maturity. But I think it's an encouraging sort of development that I think we'll see in the, in the future also pick up uh, to, uh, uh, to work well in, our, in Europe's favor, let's say. Thank you. Um, Chris, would you like to come in or Federico, do you have any comments on yeah, that? Yeah, I have a couple of comments. Uh, I think uh, uh, clearly, I mean, I totally agree with uh, uh, Mirko on the fact that in Europe we have, uh, from the point of uh, potential in terms of innovation and technology, uh, we have a uh, uh, lot of uh, uh, assets that we should exploit. Clearly, compared to China or US, we have uh, other problems. And one problem is the size of the market, because uh, uh, despite we claim to have a single European market, uh, compared to what it means having a single uh, European market in US or in China, is not the same because there are still barriers from a, a, a point of uh, uh, legislation, especially. And uh, uh, clearly, uh, for a, a company, this means that accessing uh, a, a, a wide market in Europe, uh, which needs to comprise a multitude of uh, countries, is much more complex than trying to enter in the market in US and then, boom, you access the whole market because you don't have uh, many of the limitation uh, that uh, uh, you have in, in Europe. And on the other side, I, I have also to say that uh, uh, the way companies, uh, and I'm here I'm not much referring to the SMEs, but large companies do innovation in the US is quite different than the way uh, large companies do innovation in Europe. And this is clearly, if you look at uh, who are the leading contributors in the key open source projects that are defining uh, uh, our digital infrastructure today. So if you look at the key contributors in OpenStack, you will see they are from uh, China and from US. If you look at the key contributors in uh, uh, Kubernetes, you will see that they are from China and from US. And this is the true also for most of the uh, key open source project, even in the artificial intelligence. And uh, I mean, there is, I, I have the feeling that there is a sort of uh, fear of uh, putting the hands uh, in uh, these projects, but 
detruise that uh, uh, and then you end up as a, most of large companies in Europe are anyhow in the sector are using these tools but they are not contributing to them and this means that then they are leading the way this uh, project uh, go ahead and probably we need to change this perspective. Thank you, uh, Federico. I'm now going to um, turn to some of the questions that have been posed through through the chat. Um, so the first one is uh, from uh, Rigo Vanning. So thank you, Rigo, for, for participating actively. I have a question about the data formats that are used to get interoperability from the edge to the cloud. Do you need specific things or will JSON or JSON-LD just do the trick? Um, who'd like to take that? Uh, well, I, I, uh, it's always hard to, to reason uh, on uh, whether this is really complete. But what I see is since we are also active in the W3C Web of Things uh, group, we are uh, actually heading it, um, uh, we see that JSON-LD um, as a basis seems to be quite appropriate to uh, address many of the interoperability issues. Yeah, so at least from that point of view, I would say, yes, uh, with JSON, it, you can do probably a lot or maybe even everything. Yeah, I think it depends also what you mean by edge, because of course the IoT device, will uh, diff it will be difficult that it talks uh, uh, JSON, LD and so on. Uh, you will have uh, probably more lower level uh, data format uh, at at that level and then surfacing, uh, lifting them uh, more appropriately to some more intermediary edge elements. Do, do you mean because the, the number of devices is just by nature going to be so, so different? But the, the even because uh, JSON-LD is uh, of course naturally meant for a restful uh, communication payload and uh, efficient uh, IoT level communication is not done uh, using uh, RESTful communication. So you use uh, MQTT or MQP or uh, LoRa and other things. And of course you can probably even somehow encode uh, inside their uh, JSON, but then the payload sites will be uh, big and then it's not efficient and efficiency is, uh, is important uh, at that level. So clearly- yeah, But I think- uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. May I briefly ahead, comment on that? Yeah, I yeah. think that uh, it, 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 it is a difference whether you use uh, uh, formats like JSON-LD just to describe the data format and the true payload communication is then done in a, in a separate way. And this is the approach that we take in, in uh, Web of Things that you do not do all the communication, the IoT communication uh, in JSON-LD format, but to describe how the format looks like, even proprietary or uh, other standards like OPC and so on, this is uh, this description is done in JSON-LD. Mm -hmm. And I think this split somehow makes a lot of sense. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Um, that's uh, enriched the, the point, I think, a little bit more. Um, so Ken Foster says that we lack early growth stage venture capital bridging the grants from the EU and growth stage capital. Um, and Rigo says the data market services was a nice project trying to um, connect startups with the right accelerators. Um, do you have any further um, discussions or, 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 or points perhaps on on that ability to scale the technical knowledge that we have and the industrial infrastructure that we already have available and to, to make sure that we have the next generation of companies that can be born from that and, and the new opportunities, including business opportunities that arise from this new <coughs> um, metaverse. Mirko, perhaps um, that, that's a question to you. Um, I'm really sorry, Atanya, but you just dropped out for a second. Can you? Oh, okay. No, never mind. I'll just uh, I'll pick up another question here. It's it. So Rigo says um, he has a discussion with Dave Raggett from uh, from uh, W um, uh, C three. Uh, do we need a standard from SCADA payload to JSON LD? These are very technical questions, so I'm hoping that uh, you can answer that. I don't know if that's perhaps again to Chris. Um, um, actually, I don't know. 
I simply okay. don't know. <laughs> so I have no real answer for that. What we try to, um, well, what we try to push is that knowing that we will never converge on one standard for data formats and for description of interfaces and all that stuff. We uh, acknowledge that we will have this heterogeneity and are looking for ways to bridge them. And this is again the way that we are pushing uh, the, this Web of Things activity. And uh, personally, I think this is more meaningful because you, uh, we have separate types of standards in separate domains, uh, like uh, in building, like in industries, for good reasons. Uh, so they are designed for that and they will stay there for quite some time. So our job uh, from IoT's perspective is really more to make build bridges between them, not to replace them. Thank you. Um, and on that point of building bridges rather than uh, replacing them, um, I'd like to hand over now to the uh, next colleagues who are Ignacio Lacalle Ubeda from the uh, University of uh, the Polytechnical University of Valencia, who is going to be presenting a society, and after him, Artemis uh, Volkidis from uh, Synexlis, who is going to be telling us about the open calls in IoT Engine. Um, over to you. Thank you. Thank and you. Thank you. Sorry, uh, and, and before, sorry, I'm, I'm really sorry before I pass on, I forgot to thank my panelists. <laughs> That's a huge <laughs> faux pas. So Christian, uh, Federico, Mirkos, thank you so much for sharing your insights um, and apologies for not having done that sooner. I'm looking forward to continuing the discussion in the expert groups. Thank you very much everyone. Sorry about that, Ignacio. Okay, no worries. Thank you, Tanya, for the guide presentation and also Congratulations for the whole session and, and to, thanks to the panelists before. The conversations are for today are very interesting and actually quite to the point to the presentation I'm, I'm going to make because actually I'm about to present one of the projects in the ICT56 cluster of projects that it's related with these edge IoT uh, computation architectures that are uh, being proposed at this point from projects since late uh, 2020 and in fact I'm going to present the open calls that we are launching for um, companies to try to get some funding for continue this paradigm. So I will try to be uh, very short as I don't have much time in a, in a quick in a nutshell. I am representing Assist IoT that stands for Architecture for Scalable Self, Human-Centric Intelligence, Secure and Tactile. Next Generation IoT, which is a research and innovation action and started late 2020 and would finalize in 2023. Um, represented by 15 partners and will be validated in three pilots in three different verticals, in a maritime ports, in a smart safety of workers in construction sites, and in the automotive sector with cohesive vehicle monitoring um, use cases centering on the field domains of the edge computing, smart networking, and human centricity. To be very short of our main goals, we are we have proposed and are actually now developing and will be implementing uh, an architecture based on different horizontal and vertical enablers drawing directly from the recommendation from IoT and create IoT 3D layer architecture and we are aiming at introducing this advanced context awareness or di distribute data protection, privacy, orchestration in different layers of our architecture, willing to demonstrate it in three different pilots uh, that will be performed during next year and 2023. The, the main ambitions we have, and we are expecting it to contribute to the state of the art, and, and as it has been uh, outlined before, by the, uh, Mirko and the other panelists, uh, we are focused on what actually the main points of evolution as we saw, see them in the sector, meaning um, multiple streams of a human as human-centric IoT, AI-infused applications, AI in the edge, scalability, flexibility, allowing to get uh, smarter, more secure environments for the next generation of the Internet of Things. The, the goals are 
similar to the rest of projects in our cluster. And we are continuously uh, discussing together about what we are doing in Antigans. What I would like to present today mainly is to invite you all, all the audience hearing me at this moment, to come join us through the first round of, of open calls we are launching in the project. When we were funded by European Commission, we were granted 900,000 euros to be distributed in two rounds of open calls. The first one that has just been opened in the first November last month uh, will fund seven proposals applying for 60,000 euros each, applying for a maximum duration of nine months. And we are willing to fund innovative proposals tackling some challenges related to the next generation IoT focused on one of our one out of our three pilots okay there are some let's say um, indications of what these challenges consist of that can be either pretty specific for the use cases we have uh, envisioned or either broader for contributing to the paradigm global of our architectural proposal um, I will, I, I guess this is, uh, presentation will be shared to you afterwards, but uh, so you will be able to check specifically these details. But for your information, we will be funding individual actions, no consortiums, and mainly SMEs or university research centers, meaning no large companies. The, mark, the participation will need to be contextualized, as I have said, to one of our pilots, contribute to our paradigm, and you will be joining our consortium since, since next year. What must be done or what can be done for applying for this open course? Well, present a proposal of 15 pages. Any details on the preparations are, uh, enable, are able to be consulted in our web page in the guide for applicants. And you must submit one form and you will be evaluated by external experts based on this criteria of the relevance, impact, excellence, and say a stickness to our, um, our pilots and our architecture. And globally, say the, uh, the timeline is the following. We will be closing, the, as I have said, the open call is open since November. We, it will close on 28th February next year. So we invite you all to come in and come along and present your uh, proposals. And afterwards that, Two months of evaluation will be followed by the announcement of the winning proposals that will finally join our project about June or July, summer next year. Finally, uh, these are some relevant links that you can consult. Uh, feel free to contact directly me or any of the uh, people that are uh, indicated in the, con in the contact in the webpage. If you have any question, don't hesitate to ask and you are invited to come along and present your proposals. We expect you there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nacho. So hopefully you'll uh, be seeing some applications from, from those of you um, checking in with us uh, this morning. Um, may I now invite um, Artemis to take the stage and to share your presentation whenever you're ready. Perfect. Artemis, we can see it there. So thank you very much. Can you see my screen right now? We at the moment, it's blank, or at least it is for me. Blank? There we go. That's it. It's related. So perfect. Be better, right? mm. Thank you. Excellent. That's perfect. Thank you. So thank you very much for uh, having us here and for the interesting discussions that were held. Uh, my name is Artemis Vulkidis. I work for Synetic Solution, and um, I act as a technical manager for the IoT Engine project. Now, before I present the um, open call um, opportunities that we uh, offer as a project, um, a brief introduction, we're a big consortium of 19 uh, partners covering eight countries. We started off um, sometime um, um, in 2020, so October 2020. We just passed the, the first year and the duration is uh, 36 months. So we do have a couple of years in uh, front of us. Now, if I was to um, describe the IoT engine vision in um, just one slide, I would present this one. So our work, is actually targeting the entire um, layered architecture of uh, IoT, let's say, landscape, starting out from uh, the um, component layer and up to the business layer, 
uh, featuring uh, advances in all the intermediate layers. And we do that having some um, uh, principles that we value by design. Um, mostly we focus on interoperability, security and privacy, traceability and data sovereignty by design. Now, having said that, the um, core technologies that we are developing, they can be found on, on this slide on the, on the left side. So we're working on the um, communication side with um, edge cloud connectivity and uh, dynamic resources uh, management and uh, discoverability. We are having um, very good progress in uh, offering a machine learning as a service framework that is able to run across the, um, the continuum of uh, edge for cloud, which is very, very interesting for us. And it can also have um, support uh, related to privacy preserving uh, federated learning, for example, and um, technologies like those. We are having support from uh, for augmented reality systems and the augmented reality based control and several considerations regarding cybersecurity. We have four living labs and 10 use cases, and they pertain to smart cities, smart agriculture, industry four and smart energy. Now, having said that, we are having all these um, all these activities as a project, but we would like to expand. So this is why we are launching um, two open calls. The first one is already up and running, as you can see in this slide. The deadline is uh, due end of this month, so 30th of, of December. And the, the winners, they are going to be uh, announced later in um, 2022. And they're going to be integrated into the project as partners. So accessing the entire range of uh, IoT engine um, technologies and the uh, foreground knowledge that we, that we produce uh, by the end of March. So 30th of March, 2022 we explain to be a bigger consortium. And then for those of you that um, you cannot join uh, during this uh, first open call, there will be a second round in uh, July, uh, 2022. Still, this would last again for three months. So um, end of October, 2022, the submission will end. And by December, 2022, we will um, have some more partners uh, entering the consortium until the, um, um, September 2023 that the project is due to, to end. Now, a few more details about the, the first open call. So we expect to have a total number of five winners. Uh, the budget per applicant is up to 150,000 euros. So the total budget for this first uh, round of open calls is uh, up to 750,000 euros, which is quite, let's say, big. The scope that we're interested in uh, at, this, at this point is um, open interfaces and access to new IoT systems and access to um, um, edge acceleration services, for example, uh, via um, embedded software and FPGA software uh, development. The evaluation criteria that we have, they are related to the um, uh, concept of innovation, technology, impact, and the applicant, uh, applicant team. So it's more or less um, um, uh, generic, uh, as you can find in uh, all relevant open calls. And you can find more information on our website and on uh, F Success. So um, we are funding all this. Uh, we are running all this funding process uh, through F Success. So make sure to visit our site and uh, follow us on uh, our social networks so that you can find more information. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you very much, Artemis. That was uh, very clear. And again, hopefully we'll get some um, interest in, in the calls, really offering some, some new insights and, and technologies that can uh, make um, the, uh, this, this a reality across, uh, across multiple domains. So, um, Brendan, I think we've reached the end of the session. Um, from my part, to thank Monique for the very helpful introduction and scene setting, um, panelists Chris, uh, Federico, and Mirko. Uh, looking forward to continuing to work with you um, and Brendan and the team generally, Catherine, who's been doing the moderation and the, the toing and throw, throwing from the different platforms to make sure that we've got the, the, the questions there. Monique, did you want to say any final words there? just wanted to say that it was a very dense um, and interesting discussion. 
Um, I hope everyone has been able to follow. Um, we will uh, publish a short report out of this uh, event on the ngiot.eu uh, pages, so please stay tuned. And thanks a lot, Tanya and our speakers, but also Brandon and the other colleagues that have been helping to organize this session. Absolutely. Thank you very much and have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.